So I'm actually quite happy that I have a microphone with which I can walk around because I like to walk around when I'm doing presentations. Okay. Um, so today I want to talk about my package BRMS. And as you can see, the title basically consists of like four different well, um, things. So first is multi-level modes, second Bayesian, third Stan basically, which Ben kindly introduced already, so that's nice. And then we have my own package and I'm going to all of this stuff um, in the next few minutes. Okay, so this is actually not working. Um, so the first thing is why using multi-level models. And the fact is that in, is that actually too loud? I'm not sure how to use it correctly, that's okay. Um, uh, the fact is that most data we have in science also in other areas is actually multi-level. That is, um, we have data on different levels. So. Um, sort of students nested within classes, nested within schools, and um, the students of the same class are kind of dependent on each other because they have to spend like six uh, hours per, per day together and because of this particular annoying teacher that everyone shares. Um, so, and we have to account for that, that students within the same class are more dependent on each other than, you know, students of different classes or, and classes of different schools, you know, are not that dependent than, than classes of the same school. So we want to account for that. Another example of multi-level is um, uh, actually repeated measurements. So when you measure the same subject multiple times, like for instance 10 times, then of course those observations of the same person tend to be dependent because they're from the same person. We have to, to account for that or we want to account for that. Okay, so in a simple, simple example of um, repeated measurement, um, data is actually coming from the LME4 package. It's called sleep study. And it, you know, uh, investigates the um, relation between the reaction time in milliseconds in a simple task with the days of sleep deprivation. So subjects um, get only less sleep each day, and we, we see how the reaction time goes up um, for consecutive days of sleep deprivation. And this is a typical, very simple, multi-level data. So we have um, the reaction time in milliseconds. We have the, you know, the, the days of sleep deprivation starting at day zero, so at baseline. And we see um, the important thing in uh, multi-level stuff. We see the subject ID in this case is called subject, could, could be called differently, of course, indicating to which subject each observation belongs to. And of course, we have to account for that because the observation of the same subject tends to be dependent. Mm -hmm. huh? Okay. Um, so what, uh, still not working. So what happens if we ignore the multi-level structure. Let's say on the, on the left-hand side, we have just linear regression, so modeling um, reaction time just using the days. And on the right-hand side, we have a multi-level regression taking into account that um, we have different subjects and repeated measurement. Um, and what happens is that when you look at the right-hand side, the confidence intervals, so, so the gray lines, are way larger than on the left-hand side. The mean, so the blue line, the mean regression line kind of intersects, but it doesn't have to be the case. Um, but as we can see on the right-hand side, confidence intervals are much larger because we correctly account for the dependency. And by ignoring that, we actually tend to overestimate the precision which we have. So on the left-hand side, the narrow confidence intervals are just an overestimation because we um, don't take into account that um, we have actually less information in the data um, than what, what how linear regression treats it because we have dependency. And so you really want to model your um, dependency structure because it matters. So be because you come to wrong or incorrect conclusions when you forgot or forget to um, model uh, multi-level structure. So when I'm talking about multi-level models, others talk about random effects models or mixed effects models or hierarchical models. So it's actually all of this is the same just to avoid confusion. Um, and what we also get from, from multi-level models is we get a separate regression line for each of those subjects. So so we, we not only get the sort of population level effects, which are there on the right-hand side, but also what I call group level effects for each subject. So, so we actually see that subjects differ in their baseline. So for instance, um, this person starts rather bad, and this, star, uh, this person starts rather nicely baseline, and this person, you know, is not affected by sleep deprivation at all, and this person is. So there's variation among those coefficients, so variation among the baseline, the intercept of the model, and variation of the slope across days. So in multi-level models, we get both. 
we're gonna, we get the population level effects and we get the group level effects, sometimes called fixed and random effects. I avoid these terms, I think, thanks to Ben commenting on my paper in JSS. Um, but yeah, okay. Um, so I hope I have convinced many of you that when we have multi-level structure, we actually want to go for multi-level models. Um, so why should we do it in a Bayesian way? Because we can also do it in a frequentist way, like with GLMM or uh, with LME4 possibly. So why do, you, do we want to do it in a Bayesian way? And I think there are multiple reasons, but one reason is that the information we get um, out of our algorithms, or our, out of our uh, procedures, is, is much more informative, so it's much richer than in a classical frequentist way using maximum likelihood estimation, we got because we get actually the full posterior of the parameters. So those are two parameters in the model, and we not only get the point estimate, so the mode of the, the likelihood um, and the sort of standard error, but we get the full posterior distribution, so much richer information. We can process it using like um, point estimates like mean or median, or we can compute quantiles, or we can just you know, throw the um, posterior distribution somewhere and show it to people. And um, that's actually not uh, too bad what frequentists do when, when everything is, you know, normally distributed, so in this case a frequentist um, algorithm will possibly give a good um, estimate of this parameter because the mode in this case actually is a, a measure of central ten tendency and the standard error actually you know, captures the variation well. But um, as soon as you have parameters with like skewed distributions like this standard deviation here, the mode kind of tends to be a measure of extremes rather than of of, of the central tendency, which is kind of bad for uh, for an estimate, I think, and and also the standard error tends to be not actually m measuring variation well because you know the data is, is skewed or the, the distribution is skewed, so the standard error gets affected by that. Huh? And we don't see that the parameter is actually skewed when doing frequentist method. We just get a point estimate, the mode. We get a standard error or, or no standard error at all if we know that we are dealing with standard deviations, basically. Um, so, so one advantage of Bayesian statistics is really that it's far more informative um, than the, the output of frequentist algorithms. And it comes with a dis disadvantage that it actually is more complicated to fit and it uh, takes longer, you know, but if you gather like um, data for one in a year, you can wait two days and for a large data set to, to fit actually. Uh, I had one student which was, was, uh, who was um, um, doing both frequentist and Bayesian analysis and then when, when new data came in, she just did the frequentist analysis. And when I asked her why, she said, okay, the Bayesian stuff um, uh, took too long. And I asked her how long, she said one minute. <laughs> so so there was, you know, the, there was too much because people are used to this so fast. Okay, so, so why should we use Stan to perform Bayesian inference? I don't think I have to say more other than what but Ben said. So it's basically just amazing and um, in doing all kinds of Bayesian, um, full Bayesian inference using advanced samplers and automatic differentiation. It's really nice, that it's a nice programming language. Um, yeah, so we can, can use, uh, as, as Ben introduced, um, Stan directly, which is also nice, but for, um, for you know, common models, we have already a few packages making things simpler using Stan at the backend without the new user necessarily noticing. So we have Austin Arm developed by um, the Stan development team, and uh, we have BRMS developed by, by me, basically, uh, independent, independently. Okay, so how do we, we do a multi-level model in LME4? So classical frequentist way. Okay, we call LME4, we say what's the response variable, we specify the population level effects, or fixed effects, and then we spay the group level effects, so we say that both the intercept um, and the effective days can vary um, across participants or across subjects. And then we say, what's the data set, which is sleep study. So most of you probably have heard of Bayesian statistics, but thought, okay, that's very complicated. I, I'm not able to do this myself. So we kind of expect that Bayesian statistics is complicated, but actually it isn't. So when we just change one thing, just instead of calling LMER, we call BRM, then it just works in this way. So the same way as Austin Arm, BRMS uses the LME4 um, syntax, so you can just use BRM as a drop-in replacement of LME4 um, in the same way as you can use Arsenal for this. 
Yeah, so basically nothing changes except that you get a Bayes full Bayesian inference with way more informative um, output. Okay. Um, here's just some methods you can, can do to cross-process um, BRMS with objects which are returned by BRM. I'm not going into the details. I just uh, wanted to show this slide because I heard that, that um, Ben sometimes recommends my, my package for um, writing user or human readable stand code, which is nice because I wanted to show we have also kind of some post processing options. Um, so it's BRMS is not only about writing efficient stand code, but also about you know doing something with your models. Um, so the idea of BRMS is really fitting all kinds of regression models within one framework. So rather than our stem arm, which tries to emulate um, known functions in our BRMS tries to know, build up one framework to fit up everything in one framework. So um, I'm getting there. So many, many things are um, already working and some, uh, some things uh, I still need to implement. And I just want to briefly explain uh, some examples. So for instance, here we have a sensor recurrence time of kidney infection. So people have kidney infections and sometimes they reoccur and we want to measure the time until this, this infection reoccurs. Um, and unfortunately, so fortunately for the uh, participants, um, some of them don't get the infection again, which is nice for them, but bad for us, because then we have sensor data. We only know until which point the, the patient didn't get the infection again, but we don't know uh, um, if, he, if he or she gets the infection later on. So the data is actually censored. And in BRMS, we can easily do that. We just, on the left-hand side, we make the stash, and then we say sensor, sense, and then we put in the the variable um, that contains information of censoring, so it can be left, right, or interval, of course, no censoring. And the thing is that we just basically hadn't changed the, um, the, the syntax in all other cases, so we just have the population level effects, we have the random effects, we can specify a response distribution, in this case we mo uh, model this um, recurrence time using a viable distribution. Um, so without having to you know, change the syntax, change, change the package, we just add one information and suddenly it's, it's censored. And then we can you know, plot things, for instance, the interaction between age and sex, and we see that the, the females actually um, have, have more time until the, um, um, the infection reoccurs on average. Um, another example is, for instance, if you want to model nonlinear relationship like this, so that's a simulated nonlinear non relationship using Gaussian processes, so the true, uh, the, the red, Line is a true a nonlinear function, and the, the black points are the realized data. And we can easily fit that in BRMS, for instance, using Gaussian processes. Uh, so, so this is what, what comes out when we just put GP around the variable, it fits a Gaussian process. We can also do this in a multivariate manner. We can also sort of model different Gaussian processes for different groups in our data. That's everything's possible. Then we make so some sort of nice spaghetti plots here. And GP doesn't scale well to, to large data sets, so we probably want to use splines, so we can do that as well, for instance, putting in the S function. And it suddenly fits the spline, so it's not quite as you know, perfectly in fitting this data as compared to the Gaussian process, but it does its job to accurately uh, model the nonlinear uh, non non -linear relationship. Um, and the thing is we can just, we can add multi-level structure, we can add censoring, we can add different response distribution, for instance, um, you know, um, for, for reaction times or for survival times or for count data, whatever, and everything wor still works the same, it's still in the same package and you can apply everything basically. Last example I want to show is about uh, count data, so it's the number of fish caught at a camping place and we see that clearly um, the data is sort of zero inflated because we have way too many zeros that we would naturally expect. And this is because, um, you know, there are quite a few groups of people at a camping place uh, who do not try to, to catch any fish at all. And we did not capture that, so the data is zero inflated. And we can model that in BRMS as well. For instance, um, we, we can use a zero inflated Poisson distribution by saying, okay, look, the Poisson part should be modeled by the number of persons in each group, the number of childs in each group, and whether it's a camper gr group of campers or not. And we can also say, okay, we want to perform distributional regression and estimate um, the zero inflation probability as well, uh, or model the zero inflation probability using the number of charts. And then we can plot it again. And this plot of the effective charts and the number of fish caught is actually 
um, a function of both parts of the mold, so a function of the Poisson part and a function um, of the zero inflation part, and again, you can use multi-level structure. And so on, and spines and Gaussian processes and whatever you like, um, both in the main formula and in the zero inflation formula. Okay, so that's basically it. Um, if you have questions about um, BRMS, you can look at um, the help page of BRMS and go from there, or you can look at um, the vignettes. They are um, containing also two um, papers which I've written about BRMS um, in the vignettes. We can uh, look at the list of all um, of all uh, methods we can apply, and you can visit me on GitHub or write me an email or, or write me on, on Twitter. Um, and when you have general questions about Stan, you can look at the Stan web page or ask um, Ben. Yeah. Thank you very much for your attention. So it's, it's an awkward name, right? Um, I realized that too late. So it's, it was about Bayesian regression models using SAN. But so sort of the only package that has a word's name is MGCV, really. You know, so yeah, I'm not happy with it, but yeah, anyway. Yeah, we can use so sort of the nonlinear syntax, which sort of is similar to how any NLMER does it, or NLME does it. Um, I didn't go into the details, but there are, I think, at least two vignettes explaining how you can apply parametric nonlinear stuff. Yeah, and you can, you can um, explain all those nonlinear parameters using, s again, everything you, you can use anyway. Um, so, so when I when I am doing workshops, usually I tend to explain what Bayesian inference and multi-level models is for like half a day, and then people get annoyed some, somehow. And then I teach them how to 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 do it in BRMS, and that you can easily extend everything, use a different response distribution, and then they are starting get to get happy because they don't have to change packages and because it's so easy. The only drawback is you have to wait 30 seconds for the compiler to to finish, basically, and that's that's annoying for some people. Yeah.